Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. A hundred years ago today, one of the worst race riots in U.S. history happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The Tulsa race massacre destroyed the prosperous black district of Greenwood. That was known as Black Wall Street. And its consequences, including the destruction of generational black wealth, are still being felt today. The riot was sparked by a chance encounter between a 19-year-old black man and a 17-year-old white girl in an elevator. Historians think the black teen might have tripped. As he tried to break his fall, he grabbed the white girl's arm. The local newspaper ran a trumped-up story with a headline saying, Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in Elevator. And that night, a mob of around 2,000 white people gathered outside the courthouse to demand that deputies hand over the black teen. By dawn of the next day, on June the 1st, a mob of 10,000 whites surrounded Greenwood. They burned the neighborhood down to the ground, house by house, block by block. They set up a machine gun to fire into the neighborhood. They dropped firebombs from airplanes onto people and onto buildings. We still don't know for certain how many people died. But some estimates say as many as 300 black, black Tolsons were killed. The massacre also erased black wealth, estimated at $27 million in today's dollars. Despite all of that, the Tulsa race massacre has been absent from most U.S. history books. But today, President Biden became the very first, very first president to visit Tulsa to commemorate the massacre. For much too long, the history of what took place here was told in silence cloaked in darkness. But just because history is silent, it doesn't mean that it did not take place. And while darkness can hide much, it erases nothing. It erases nothing. Some injustices are so heinous, so horrific, so grievous, they can't be buried, no matter how hard people try. And so it is here, only, only with truth, can come healing and justice and repair only with truth. May 1921, formerly enslaved black people and their descendants are here in Tulsa, a boom town of oil and opportunity in a new frontier. On the north side, across the rail tracks that divided the city already segregated by law, they built something of their own, worthy, worthy of their talent and their ambition. It wasn't everyone, but there was enough hate, resentment, and vengeance in the community. Enough people who believed that America does not belong to everyone, and not everyone is created equal. Native Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, Black Americans, a belief enforced by law, by badge, by hood, and by noose that speaks to that lit the fuse. It lit it by the spark that it provided. A fuse of fury. Hell was unleashed. Literal hell was unleashed. Through the night and into the morning, the mob terrorized Green with torches and guns, shooting at will. A mob tied a black man by the waist to the back of their truck with his head banging along the pavement as they drove off. A murdered black family draped over the fence of their home outside. An elderly couple knelt by their bed praying to God with their heart and their soul when they were shot in the back of their heads. Private planes, private planes dropping explosives. The first and only domestic aerial assault of its kind on an American city here in Tulsa. The president also presented his proposals for closing the country's racial wealth gap. Because while black wealth in Tulsa was destroyed by violence, black Americans' opportunity to build wealth has also been hurt by nationwide policies, by discrimination in education and in jobs, by discrimination in housing, by the building of highways that destroy black neighborhoods and black well-being. 
We can see what the problem is and we can see what has caused it. The question now is, what do we do about it? Joining us now from Tulsa is Tremaine Lee. He's an MSNBC correspondent and host of the Into America podcast. Tremaine also just did a documentary, which I highly recommend, called Blood on Black Wall Street, the legacy of the Tulsa massacre. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight, Tremaine. No, of course, as always, Alina. Thank you for having me. So what's the reaction of the folks on the ground, the folks around you, uh, to the president's visit? It is very important to have a president, the first one ever, to come to Tulsa specifically to commem commemorate this massacre. Yeah, it, it really was a, a standout moment. I'm here on the Greenwood Avenue, a stretch of historic Greenwood Avenue. Uh, and there were hundreds of people out here across from the Greenwood Cultural Center where uh, President Biden spoke. And there was an excitement and energy in the air, right? Many of them, uh, I'd say most of them probably couldn't hear his speech. Uh, but when one guy came out, it kind of sort of almost looked like Joe Biden. The, the crowd erupted in cheers, right? The idea that this moment, that the president of the United States came here to finally uh, make visible what had been uh, for so long buried in the shadow and you, you, that clip you played, um, cutting right to the truth in really um, you know, stark detail about the horrific nature of what went down here um, and talking about the truth and how important the truth is if America ever wants to move forward, really clear-eyed, looking itself in, America that, uh, in the mirror that America could finally reckon with who it has been and hopefully move forward in a different direction. But this moment, it can't be understated. And again, you laid out um, in, in detail in your monologue what went down in this community. And the folks, let's not get it twisted at all, are still grappling uh, with what happened 100 years ago. I mean, 100 years sometimes can sound like a long time, but that is, you know, not, that's a lifetime, right? That's not, that's not a very, very long time in terms of generational wealth that was lost. The president's proposals today, it seemed that not only was he willing to speak the truth, and again, if you don't speak the truth, it doesn't make the history different. It just means that you're not willing to be honest about it. Um, his proposals included helping black people to buy homes and helping black businesses. Do you think or do you think that the folks on the ground that you've spoken to think that's enough for the survivors and descendants of the Tulsa massacre or do they want more? I would say the folks I talk to, uh, certainly what will be enough is making folks whole, right? So even though you, you lay it out plain, what was, what was stolen, what was lost, and all that was damaged, and how it impacted folks, uh, they want to be made whole. But I think the first step is actually making the case. They're, because this story in particular uh, was so buried, and stories like it all across the country, kept out of school books, not taught in schools, not passed down to your families, um, then it just kind of evaporates as, as if it never happened. But now making the case and saying, here's the injury, here's the the impact, right? That lays the groundwork for any conversation about the R word, reparations, which we know is politically divisive, but we'll, we can say this is what happened to these people, this is what was stolen, and this is how uh, the government was complicit in all this. And so, is it enough, this talk right now, even Biden's proposals of billions of dollars, is it enough right now? Quite frankly, no. Uh, but it is a, a good sign and a step in the right direction for many folks who have been calling for such action for a very long time here in Tulsa, but also on a national level. The spark of the massacre was, you know, historians say it was a trumped up charge against a black teen, which feel like there's so many moments in American history uh, which begin with that. Um, but it also feels like there was a, a specific type of resentment towards black wealth and prosperity that, you know, the folks in Tulsa were, were you know, on the victim end of a backlash to the fact that they were independent um, and, you know, putting money back into their own community. Is that a piece of this too? And what are the folks on the ground speaking to you about in terms of that idea that there is a resentment of black prosperity that contributed to this and that reparations may be needed to make those families whole? Well, the, the jealousy, envy, and hate are all intertwined. You think about this is happening at a time where black subservience is codified in the law, and there is a hierarchy, and there is a structure here, and any um, you know straying from that 
could mean violence. And that's what happened here. You have the spark of Dick Rowland um, and Sarah Page, uh, but certainly that resentment from everything I've, I've heard from historians and uh, people who, who understand the history of this community, that spark lit up because you had this very self-sufficient self enclave um, that had beauty salons and restaurants and barbershops. And then you have the nerve and the gall to step outside of that. And then the full weight of um, you know, that violence was heaped upon this community and then also sanctioned, sanctioned by the local government. And you had, um, you know, white citizens deputized by law enforcement created this kind of powder keg. Uh, but, but you're right, the, the, the center of this was this community with so much that these black folks had the audacity and the gall uh, to be self-sufficient and be independent and have the gall and audacity to dream, right, and to own homes and provide for their children and do it all in a black space. Um, that was just a, a bridge too far when everything went down. I imagine some of the folks in Tulsa may have read some of our founding documents. Maybe they believe that America um, is supposed to be a place where we can all achieve our dreams. I don't know. I, I believe that. Maybe I'm naive, too. Uh, Tremaine Lee, thank you so much for being here and for helping us understand what's going on on the ground on this historic day. Please stay safe. Tulsa's Greenwood District wasn't the only black Wall Street. That's important to know. Other prosperous black communities early in the 20th century included neighborhoods in Durham, North Carolina, Richmond, Virginia, and in Syracuse, New York. But according to a USA Today op-ed, it wasn't mob violence that hurt these communities. It was the government which built literal highways that cut through these thriving neighborhoods. And joining us now is Eddie Cloud. He's the chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University, and he's an MSNBC contributor. Okay, Professor, what is your takeaway from the president's speech today? He was the first president to visit Tulsa. Uh, he's following a president who last bit is visited Tulsa on Juneteenth, so it's a little bit of a 180. <laughs> Well, first of all, it's great to see you, Zerlina. Um, look, I thought it was a really important moment. Uh, the, as you said in, in the segment with Tremaine, when, if, whenever the president shows up anywhere, particularly for a moment like this, it's important. Um, he did a lot of work around framing, which is really critical. How do we think about race in this moment? Why is it so important? And that framing, I hope, sets the stage for substantive policy uh, issues, certain policy efforts to address deep racial uh, inequality in the country. Then there's the second kind of component. The second component, I thought, uh, involved in some ways an echo of the past. Remember, he, echo he, he invokes, we shall overcome. Right, as, as that mantra of the civil rights movement. And to come out of the mouth of the president reminds one of March 15th, 1965, and that is Lyndon Baines Johnson invoking we shall overcome uh, as, as a framework for uh, civil rights legislation. And so here we have to continue to overcome. Again, I hope it's a foreshadow of policy to come, because uh, we need to move from just simply telling the truth, which sets the stage for reconciliation, but also both setting the stage for repair. And that's where we need to get to, not just simply cutting the check, but actually providing a frame so that we can uproot the ugliness at the heart of the country that Tulsa represents. How important, though, do you think it is that he did tell the truth? Because, as I sort of joked um, and said in a, in a lighthearted way, but it, it's, it's deadly serious, the last president we had, the one who the end of the presidency was a whole insurrection of white nationalists storming the Capitol, that president went to Tulsa on Juneteenth, and he sent a very different message. Uh, he went there intentionally to send a message that was very different to this president. How important is it that today we saw the president speak to that truth? Because... You know, all this critical race theory criticism, it's not a coincidence that it's happening in a moment where the president is willing to speak the truth. No, I think it's absolutely important. I've never heard a president speak like this in my lifetime. That includes Barack Obama, right? To talk about systemic racism, to, to talk about the Klan infiltrating every aspect of government. Right. He should have mentioned that, in fact, it was the Klan that wrote the Immigration uh, Act of 1924. That seems to be the, the, the underlying uh, motivation for a lot of immigration policy that is being promulgated by the Republican Party today. So I think it's really important for that kind of honesty. In some ways, it's like this, Zelina. President Biden is offering a rhetoric right, that is completely, mm -hmm. to my mind, to my experience, unprecedented. It's just that the policy isn't unprecedented. The response isn't unprecedented. Mm -hmm. He's making 
descriptive claims that the country that we live in was in fact a deliberate result of policy decisions. Racial inequality was deliberately at the heart of the founding, foundation and for, founding of the country. And now he needs policy responses, I think, that are just as unprecedented because we have to be just as deliberate to rid ourselves of this racial inequality that we put there in the first place. But I think it's important truth was at the heart, is, is, is the beginning, is at the heart of it all. So in terms of that plan, some of the specifics include, um, you know, targeted things to reduce the racial wealth gap, um, like uh, investments in housing. Um, Marsha Fudge got name checked today, uh, the secretary of housing and urban development. But it, it doesn't include student loans, which as a black woman, knowing the statistics and my lived experiences, I feel like this may may have been good to include. What's your response to not including student loan debt in these plans that he announced today? Well, I think it's particularly coming out of the Great Recession and, and the effects of the Great Pandemic. Uh, we know that the Great Recession, because of the Great Recession of 2008, all of the wealth gains of the 1990s were just simply wiped out. We know that credit card debt has surpassed, uh, a student loan debt has surpassed credit card debt in this country, and that African Americans are disproportionately uh, uh, burdened with uh, uh, student, lo uh, student loan debt. So it seems to me that he needs a plan at the scale of the crisis. It seems still to be, at least to me, and Zerlina, I'm, I'm open to being corrected in this regard, to be tinkering around the edges. And it, a lot of it sounds familiar. A lot of it sounds familiar from Democratic Party coming out of the DLC, the third way. A lot of it sounds like the stuff we've heard from the Republican side, right? If we're going to tell the truth about how this country came to be, we need to be a little bit more imaginative, aggressive, and daring in how we respond to it, I think. I mean, look, I don't know the answer. Hey, if we knew the answer, we'd be rich and on an island, Professor, if we knew the answer to America's <laughs> racial problems. Um, <laughs> so, so the, you know, the, the Tulsa massacre was just one of the massacres uh, at the early part of the 20th century. And it was one of the only massacres at, uh, in one of these prosperous black neighborhoods that was self-sufficient. Um, another thing we did here is we built highways literally through black neighborhoods, um, you know, in order to help the white sub suburbanites get to where they needed to go. But you're sort of destroying uh, the ability of black neighborhoods to thrive. Um, why is it that it's so hard for us to see the policy as racism when it's pretty easy to identify when the rhetoric is overtly racist? It's always some it's always hard for us to pinpoint the racism when it's embedded in the policies. Right, because we have a tendency actually coming out of the, the approach from the law of thinking about racism as intentional acts of prejudice. Right, so we want to identify the individual who holds noxious racist views, discriminating against individuals, right, who are then denied opportunity. And when we think about racism in that kind of narrow way, which is very legalistic, right, we lose sight of the systemic elements of racism in this country. Critical race theory in the law actually helps us understand this, but that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. But when we think about urban planning, Urban planning has had at its core a way in which race gets embedded in the very logic of how space is organized. It's not just in Durham, North Carolina. It's not just in Syracuse, New York. But when we think about how cities have been constituted, Chicago, Detroit, Boston, New York, mm -hmm. Birmingham, Atlanta, highways divide right? Wealthy neighborhoods from poor neighborhoods, white neighborhoods from black neighborhoods, right? And so the very ways in which we move about the United States, we learn race. We learn who, which populations are valued, which populations are over-policed, which populations are protected, which populations are subject to un, 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 unreconstructed violence in, a, in the way. So I think it's really important to understand that when we think of racism as either someone donning a, a hood and screaming the N-word or just someone enacting individual acts, I mean, enacting discrimination, right, we are narrowing the scope of, of, of the way in which we built this society in, the country, in this country. 
I hope that makes sense. It's so important to understand what you just explained. No, it does. It does make sense to me, and I hope those at home, because you know you broke that all the way down for us, and that's what I why I like bringing you on, uh, Professor Eddie Glad. Thank you so much for being here tonight and helping us understand this moment in history, which is an important one. Please stay safe. Coming up. A voting rights showdown in Texas. Governor Greg Abbott is making threats after Democrats in the state legislature staged a walkout over a restrictive voting bill. The lawmaker who led that walkout joins me next. And as we go to break, with threats to voting rights across the country, a warning from President Biden over Memorial Day weekend about just how fragile our American democracy is. We'll be right back. The mission falls to each of us, each and every day. Democracy itself is in peril, here at home and around the world. What we do now, what we do now, how we honor the memory of the fallen will determine whether or not democracy will long endure. Texas has some of the country's strictest voting laws. But during the last presidential election, the state's most populous county, Harris County, made voting easier because of the pandemic, of course. They added choices like drive through voting and 24-hour voting so that more people could vote more safely. Those changes helped produce the state's highest voter turnout in decades. And you'd think that would be something to celebrate. But no, not for Texas Republicans. Instead, Governor Greg Abbott made voter fraud a top priority, even though voter fraud was virtually non-existent in his state. So Republicans started trying to push through an extremely restrictive voting bill that would roll back all of the improvements made during the pandemic and then some. We've been talking about this on the show for weeks. Passage of the bill always seemed inevitable. It had the backing of Republican lawmakers in the legislature they control, and it had the backing of the Republican governor. And on Sunday night, with an hour left in the legislative session, Republicans tried to push it through. But then, the chair of the House Democratic Caucus had an idea. According to the Texas Tribune, State Representative Chris Turner texted his Democratic colleagues, quote, leave the chamber discreetly. Do not go to the gallery. Leave the building. Their absence, Turner knew, would leave the House without the required number of members to proceed with a vote. And so Democrats walked out, and they stopped the vote from happening. Call it one small victory, however temporary, for democracy in America. And joining me now is the Texas House Democratic Caucus Chair, State Representative Chris Turner. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Honored to be with you. So how and why did you decide to stage a walkout to block this voting bill? How did you come up with this idea? Well, it, it's important to state that, that the decision uh, to, to do what we did uh, is it just, is it, was a collective decision by uh, the majority of the Democratic caucus, one that had been discussed over a period of days uh, and throughout the day on Sunday. Uh, and I give all credit to the members of our caucus who worked uh, collaboratively together uh, in our opposition, our unified opposition to this vote suppression bill uh, to do whatever it took to defeat it. And we had a multi-pronged strategy 
uh, to delay the bill because we were facing a hard deadline of midnight to pass uh, bills for this legislative session. And we tried to push it as close as we could to midnight. Uh, we were well on our way to, to doing that through a series of things we had done throughout the day. And uh, many members actually had already left. Uh, they left when the debate on the bill began. So uh, most of the members of the Democratic caucus were already gone by the time I, I sent that text message uh, to get the remaining members uh, out of the chamber to deny the quorum. So business had to stop at that point. In terms of the strategy, it seems to me like it's quite dramatic. I mean, it's only happened a few times in the history of Texas. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that we are now talking about the Texas voting bill as a national story. 43 states actually introduced voter suppression after the 2020 election. Do you, do you hope um, that what you did in this dramatic fashion um, allows us all to sort of put our focus on the voter suppression efforts that are happening around the country and including and in Texas? Well, I, I hope so. And I hope that uh, people across the country could, could have heard the words of the dean of our caucus, uh, Representative Sinfronia Thompson from Houston, who has served in the legislature nearly 50 years. And she spoke eloquently uh, about uh, how she remembers the days of segregation in the civil rights movement and, uh, and how hard fought these gains were for all people to have access to the ballot box, the fundamental bedrock of our, of our democracy. And that's what's at stake with these Republican vote suppression bills around the country. These are anti-voter bills. They are trying to make it harder for Americans to cast a ballot. It, it, should, be, it should be unconscionable and unfathomable to every single person in this nation. Uh, and that's what we're up against. And it is vital that Congress pass a new Voting Rights Act so that all Americans can have protection from these types of suppressive laws. Do you think that that's what's most important going forward is the congressional Democrats in Washington make sure to get a bill uh, through the through the Senate and onto the president's desk to deal with these voter suppression on the state level? I, I do. I think that's the ball game. Uh, I think because this is going to continue to happen. Uh, Republicans have continued to push uh, legislation that makes it harder to vote. Uh, and we haven't even talked about redistricting yet. Uh, Texas and all the states around the country are going to be mm -hmm. dealing with redistricting later this year. And it is very important when these districts are drawn that there be a robust uh, federal uh, voting rights act to guard against intentionally discriminatory maps that Texas and other states have a long history of, a documented history of. And we need that federal voting rights act in order to protect the rights of all voters, protect the rights of voters to elect the candidates of their choice in newly drawn districts uh, next year. So turning back to Texas, Governor Abbott has vowed to take up the bill during a special session. So the walkout is a temporary solution. Um, is there anything to your knowledge that Texas Democrats can do to block the bill in the long term? Well, well, we'll have to see what the governor decides to do. I, I fully expect that he will call a special session at some point, and he will uh, undoubtedly uh, put this uh, this topic back on the agenda. And only he has the ability to control the agenda in a special session. He's immensely powerful in the context of a special session. Um, but uh, so the circumstances will change. What will not change is Democrats' resolve in the Texas House and in the Texas Senate uh, to continue to fight these uh, suppressive anti-voter bills at every opportunity, uh, at every turn. And uh, you know it's impossible to say right now what that looks like. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, that, that, that could happen or may not happen. Uh, we'll be ready no matter what. Uh, we'll be ready to all we can to protect our constituents uh, and all Texans and their sacred right to vote. Well, it is the the integrity of our democracy that is at stake. And so it's critically important that we have folks uh, who understand that. Texas State Representative Chris Turner, thank you so much for being here tonight. Please stay safe. While so many states are trying to suppress the vote, others are trying to make voting easier. So we like to highlight the good news too. The Nevada Senate has just passed a bill to send every registered voter a mail-in ballot. What an idea. The only way you wouldn't receive one is if you opt out. The bill now heads to the governor's desk.
The state Senate also passed a bill yesterday that would give Nevada the title of the first in the nation primary. You remember that. It would switch the state's caucus to a primary and move it up on the calendar before the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary, which I'm sure a lot of folks at home are happy to hear. That bill is also headed to the governor's desk. But, but, whether Nevada really does become the first in the nation primary is up to the national party leaders, so who knows? But maybe, I don't know, make your voice heard on that one if you were frustrated the night of the Iowa caucus night. Remember that? Coming up, the COVID outlook heading into summer 2021. Dr. Kavita Patel joins us with what to expect. Plus, getting infrastructure across the finish line, a preview of tomorrow's White House meeting with a key Senate Republican. We'll be right back. is ticking for Senate Republicans and the White House to reach a deal on infrastructure. President Biden is set to meet with Senator Shelley Moore Capito tomorrow. She's leading a group of six Republicans trying to negotiate a deal. On the Sunday shows over the weekend, Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg reiterated his support for parts of the plan that's not traditionally infrastructure. But Senator Capito wants to stick with what we're used to calling infrastructure, like roads and bridges. The fact that they philosophically seem to agree that the trillion dollar investments are, are the kind of thing we need to be doing right now, that's encouraging. But we aren't exactly uh, aligned. In fact, there's a lot of daylight here. We disagree on the on the definition of, of infrastructure, and we've been working with the president to bring it back to the physical core um, idea of infrastructure that we've worked so well on in the past. Secretary Buttigieg also placed a one-week deadline on negotiations, so there's a clear direction for a pathway forward when Congress returns next week. Here to talk about the state of negotiations and what we can expect is NBC's national political reporter, Sahil Kapoor. Sahil, last week we saw both sides move closer to a compromise, which feels like a big moment in today's Washington, but they still remain about $1.4 trillion apart, which feels like a lot. I don't know if you, you think that's a big number. Uh, what's the possibility of something actually happening here? Well, it depends on what you define as some things, Erlina. There is some possibility, of course, of uh, President Biden and Republicans agreeing on a surface transportation bill that funds roads and bridges. It's going to be much smaller than what he had in mind. So there's something like that that potentially could happen. But the odds of uh, Republicans agreeing with President Biden on a major infrastructure deal that funds his other priorities, including child care, elder care, the human infrastructure parts that he spent a lot of time talking about. I don't see I don't see how that could happen, given the red lines that these two sides have drawn. So the real question is, can Biden come to a deal with Senate Republicans that gives him something and then maybe try to do other things with Democrats alone? 
Is the White House in a position to place deadlines on these negotiations? What is sort of the what is the power dynamic here between Republicans who are coming to the table a million dollars short of what the president has proposed? Not really. The White House is not in a position to impose deadlines. It's ultimately up to Congress, and they don't have any obligation to listen to what the White House wants. Where the White House has influence is over uh, Senate Democratic leadership, and it could try to cajole and coax certain members uh, who are on the fence, certain holdouts by saying, we'll do this, this, and that for you. But at the end of the day, these negotiations are going to go on for as long as Senator Joe Manchin wants them to. He is the probably the 50th vote in the Senate Democratic Caucus. And he's the one that needs to be convinced that it's time uh, for the party to go it alone. And look, the key thing to know about Manchin is there's not going to be a specific moment where he says, OK, now I'm ready. That never happened on COVID relief, that $1.9 trillion bill. He never said, OK, now I'm ready to go it alone, do the budget vehicle. He kept calling for bipartisanship until the very end. It was up to the White House and Democratic leadership to make a judgment about when he would be ready and to put this bill in front of him and that he would vote yes. They're going to have to do the same thing here. They're not going to be able to rely on a, a simple public read from Manchin uh, saying, I'm ready to bypass Republicans now, because I don't think he's going to do that. So what were some of the things that he was saying when he finally gave in that, I don't know, could help de- uh, you know the White House and Democrats in Congress who want to see this get passed, could help at least identify when that moment has happened. Is there any indication that that moment is soon for Sir Senator Manchin? You know, I read his statement several times on the 1.9 trillion COVID relief bill as to why he voted yes. And the bottom line was he thought it was a good bill. He didn't say, he didn't say, you know, have airy fairy statements about bipartisanship. He didn't even mention the fact that Republicans uh, it didn't end up supporting it. He didn't talk about the fact, which, by the way, he did talk about separately, but not in his statement, that uh, the bill included various Republican ideas and amendments and that sort of thing. So those are the kinds of things that, that are necessary if you look at past recent precedent uh, to try to get Joe Manchin on board. He needs to be convinced that Democrats tried to uh, negotiate with Republicans. He needs to be convinced the bill is good and that it will help West Virginia. And this is where Democrats do have a real inroad with Joe Manchin. He believes infrastructure is important and he knows that West Virginia needs it. And Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's hard to believe that he's going to be the vote to kill it. It's just going to be a twisty, windy roller coaster ride to get him to yes. Well, I mean, a windy road to yes is better than a windy road to nowhere. So, you know, if if, if Democrats are looking at a well, this might take longer than we would have hoped, but eventually we can get something passed, then that is a good legislative strategy. Um, And in hindsight, it will look very smart, I suppose. But that's all hypothetical based on uh, your reporting. So West Virginia's Joe Manchin, lately he seems to be the focus of these conversations. He's in the middle of these negotiations. Um, And and we've already sort of spoken to where he stands. What about Kirsten Sinema? Where does she stand? Has she set, made any statements or signaled that um, she is willing to also go along with at least a part of the president's proposal here? It's true. Manchin does seem to be in the middle of everything. And one of the reasons for that is not only is he from the most conservative state represented uh, by a Democrat, but he speaks freely. He speaks all the time to the press, myself included. Um, he talks to reporters and we get his thoughts and then people ruminate over them. Cinema is different. Senator Cinema does not speak to reporters very often. She does not make nearly as many public pronouncements. So she's a bit more of an enigma uh, on this front. But I, I haven't seen anything to suggest that she is going to be a uh, she's going to draw irreconcilable red lines or that she's going to try to get to know on infrastructure. There are issues where she might want to pick her battles with the party. Clearly, the minimum wage was one mm-hmm. of them, and she's taken her lumps from the left for that. But I haven't seen any indication that uh, infrastructure is going to be the issue where she decides to draw a line against her party, Zerlina. It's such a fascinating thing to watch. Um, Well, I'm a political nerd, so it's fascinating for me. But I hope for folks at home it was helpful to have you, Sahil, uh, to understand all the drama in Washington. NBC's Sahil Kapoor, thank you so much for being here tonight. Please stay safe. Memorial Day. 
the unofficial start to hot girl summer. No, just kidding. Just regular summer. It was surprisingly really cold this year, though, so you really couldn't have hot girl summer. Uh, Baltimore's high was 58 degrees, and it was the coldest on record. In Philly, the high was 54, and that also broke a record. The same was true in Pittsburgh and in New York City, but that didn't stop travelers from taking advantage of the very first holiday weekend after mask mandates were lifted by the CDC. The record cold was met by a record number of passengers. The TSA reported the highest number of airport travelers since the beginning of the pandemic. So whether it's hot or cold, we're all ready to get back to some sense of normalcy. And that presents other challenges, like what to do with the kids once school is out for summer break, particularly those kids who are too young to get vaccinated because they're under 12 and they don't qualify for a vaccine. Here to walk us through all of this and what we should do after the unofficial start to just regular summer. I'm not going to say hot girl summer again. Is Dr. Kavita Patel. She's the former Obama White House Health Policy Director and an MSNBC medical contributor. Dr. Patel, wh what's your guidance for parents? Because I've been thinking a lot about them. I don't have kids. But for parents with kids who are not old enough to get vaccinated, I feel like the guidance is a little muddled for them. Should they go to camp? It, it is. is that safe for them to go to camp? W what do you say about that? <laughs> yeah, it's really, it is muddled. And, and I'll preface everything by saying that it's partly because this is a fluid situation. The CDC's guidance in general is confusing, but then it's also a weekly evolving situation where we're seeing 53% decreases in cases over the last month. And we're hoping that as vaccinations trickle upwards, that that'll come down dramatically. Bottom line, parents need to get their kids outdoors, camp activities. They absolutely can stay safe. Indoors, still, even I would strongly recommend unvaccinated children or any unvaccinated adults wear masks. Remember, the mask doesn't just protect you. It protects others from you in case you're carrying an infection. The big debate is outdoors. I have my own kids outdoors without masks mm. unless they're in kind of crowded spaces. And that's really what the CDC says. Now, can you take a seven-year-old and like tell them, no, stay six feet? You can, but it's hard to do if they're playing soccer or if they're trying to play with each other. So I think that if you're being really kind of conservative, you can have your child just wear a mask to make it easier. They don't complain. I will say, though, I'm from Texas and it gets pretty hot and it becomes problematic if you're expecting kids to wear fabric masks and deal with, you know, 100 degree heat. Get kids outside. It's the safest place to be. It's so, so true. And, you know, as somebody who attended camp every summer and then I was a camp counselor, I've been thinking a lot about all the different parts of like the day in camp, like you're on the bus to go to the pool or like you're going to do an activity. Um, and so there's a lot of inside and then you're outside and then you're inside and then you're outside. And so it just feels like uh, parents need a little bit of guidance on that so they can make sure they're making smart yeah. decisions. Um, in an interview with The Guardian, Dr. Fauci warned everyone, and I think this was an important warning because it does feel like we're at the end of the tunnel. He said, don't declare victory despite the lowest rates in a year. I mean, I was reading uh, numbers this morning. There were zero deaths in the UK to, uh, today or yesterday, rather, because I was reading this morning. So we're at a place. Our, our U.S. numbers and other places are doing so much better. Um, so why is he sort of adding a caveat there? What are some of the causes for concern that he's looking at that we should be aware of? Yeah, I think what Dr. Fauci is doing, which he should, is taking a global view. And none of us can predict whether or not there becomes a series of mutations to a virus that creates, you know, what we call immune escape, where your vaccination doesn't necessarily protect you. However, Zerlina, it is incredibly low risk to be a vaccinated individual in the United States and have any of the problems that I think unvaccinated individuals have. And that's why Dr. Fauci is trying to put a little bit of a caveat because the majority of the world is not vaccinated. And Zerlina, if we line up all the manufacturers, it's hard to imagine that we can get everybody vaccinated this year, which is a tragedy. So I think what he's trying to do is urge caution. And by the way, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation has done modeling on this, and you can see it at ihme.org, where if we continue with precautions like masks, we can essentially get to zero COVID cases in the United States. Compare that, Zerlina, with Brazil, 
which is just continuing to kind of, you know, bubble out of control. So that's why I think you see a tale of two countries, seeing so many countries that are desperate and need a vaccine. And I hope that we can start shifting the conversation in America from cases and hospitalizations and deaths to layers of protection and policy that protects people, including vaccinated ones, to vaccine equity, which is an incredibly important thing for us to all return to normal. It's so important. Um, so today, one of the things that um, I was happy to see is that the World Health Organization announced a new naming system uh, for COVID-19 variants, which I was very excited to hear because I was like, we are way too racist <laughs> as a society yeah. to name these variants after their country of origin. It stigmatizes the country of origin. So, so what's that all about? Explain the new naming system and maybe whether or not you think it's a good idea. Oh, I think it's a great idea. You know, sometimes um, public policy and world organizations get it right. And this one, they got it right. They basically, instead of saying B117, which by the way, I think is really to you, your father, me, we're all comfortable with now. But instead of yeah. saying that, and people were referencing the country of origin, the UK variant, the Indian variant. And this just puts the Greek alphabet to it, kind of in order that they discovered the variants of concern. So alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, is the B117 variant, which is dominant here in the United States. This is a worldwide kind of uh, nomenclature. So everybody now can use something even. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought up the point about racism, um, because I'm also concerned that, you know, focus seen on appropriately on the Wuhan kind of concerns about whether a lab leak was responsible can just continue to stimulate anti-Asian hate. So we have to watch our language because mm. words matter everywhere. It's so, so important, important context there. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you so much for being here as always and helping yes. us survive the pandemic, which we're still doing. I'm still trying to do it. <laughs> Please stay safe. Coming up. Naomi Osaka bows out of the French Open. I'll get into why the tennis star's decision to leave Paris is leading to a broader discussion about athletes and their mental health. We'll be right back. Gentlemen and fans, if you would, a hand for the two competitors who played in this finals match tonight. Last week, we talked about tennis superstar Naomi Osaka and her decision not to do any press at the French Open because she wanted to protect her mental health. Well, after she made that announcement, Roland Garros fined her $15,000 for skipping a news conference. The next day, she withdrew from the tournament. Osaka wrote on Instagram that since 2018, she's been suffering from bouts of depression and needed to take time away from tennis. We've seen how some interactions with the press can affect an athlete's mental health and leave them upset or even sad. What do you feel caused that? It was just one of those bad days at the office. Oh, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm done. From where you stood on the court and from talking to him after the play, what, what's your reaction to it? What's your version? 
What do you mean, what's my version? Well, did he think that the game was tied, or did he think that you guys had it salted away? How do I know that? I thought we were all aware of what was going on. That's my view. So I don't know what JR was thinking. I don't know the question you're trying to ask. I was just trying to see if you, you knew exactly what his state of mind was. Did he think that you guys had it won, or did he think he was trying to make a play? No. Not sure. Okay. What do you mean, I'm not sure? No, I don't know his state of mind. Did you know if he knew the score? Thank you. That's one of my favorite moments in all of sports history. Okay. Osaka has been in the spotlight for playing tennis since she was 16 years old. She's been constantly bombarded by questions from the press, sometimes with, without any regard for her young age or her openness about having anxiety. I've always had a problem with the way we treat and commodify athletes, and their mental health is no exception to that. If Naomi Osaka had a broken leg or was even recuperating from an injury, concessions would have been made during the tournament and for the mandatory press conferences after a match. But given the stigma that surrounds mental health, we don't give someone the safety and support they need when dealing with depression or anxiety. And yes, definite strides have been made when it comes to acknowledging mental health and mental illness. But clearly, we still have a ways to go. Joining me now, back with us, Jamel Hill. She's a contributing writer for The Atlantic, host of the podcast Jamel is Unbothered, and co-host of Carrie and Jamel Won't Stick to Sports, and Dave Zirin. He's the sports editor for The Nation and host of the podcast Edge of Sports. He also wrote a great op-ed titled The French Open's Treatment of Naomi Osaka, Hurts Athletes Everywhere. Jamel, I want to start with you since we talked about this last week when this story first uh, developed and Naomi said she didn't want to do press events and press conferences. You were here uh, talking about it. What is your response to what transpired in this story over the weekend? Uh, first off, thanks for having me. And got to say what's up to my brother, Dave Zirin, who I always enjoy being on air with. How you doing, Dave? Um, doing you know, well, thank you. I'm just, a, I'm just a little amazed that it, we have gotten to this point. It seems as if the officials at the French Open, and not just them, of all the leaders of all the major tournaments uh, in professional tennis, they decided to bring a bazooka to a rock fight. And by trying to flex on mm -hmm. Naomi Osaka and trying to show her who's boss and to put her in her place, they've had a situation that is now fully blown up in their faces. They have just shown how little they care and value the second ranked tennis player in the world, someone who is slowly and wonderfully becoming the next woman up in this sport, and they have treated her poorly in this entire situation. You can't tell me that it's better for Naomi Osaka to not be in the French Open, all right? And so to me, it just seemed like there should have been a workable compromise in order to get and make sure that Naomi Osaka was a competitor in this. If she didn't want to do the press conferences, fine. Just continue to fight her the money and just move on or just come up with some kind of workable solution. The fact that it got to this point, I put that squarely on the tennis officials in this sport. You know, I feel like that's such a persuasive argument, Dave, because it feels to me like, you know, she, her not being in the French Open has to cost them more money than her not doing a press conference to promote the sport of tennis, which is the argument that they use as to why you need to do those press conferences after matches, even if you lose. You write in your op-ed that the French Open's treatment of Osaka is bad for all athletes, not just ones in tennis um, or female athletes who are already at a di disadvantage. Why do you think that is? Oh, th there's something very nefarious afoot here, Zerlina, that, that goes way beyond issues of mental health and depression, although that should be enough, frankly for this to be a settled issue. Okay, she's dealing with serious mental wellness issues. She says she can't do the press conferences. End of story. That's where this story should end. But there's something else going on here that I think is, is quite noxious. Naomi Osaka isn't just a rising tennis star. She's also someone who bulldozed the issue of Black Lives Matter into the country club lily white world of tennis. She did that. It took a tremendous courage. It took tremendous bravery. And when I read the letter that was signed, not just by French Open officials, but the officials of Wimbledon, 
the U.S. Open, Australian Open, saying, if you don't do these press conferences, don't bother showing up. We don't even want you in our tournaments. That, to me, was the killing of the of the ant with the bazooka. You know what I'm saying? And that, to me, is is I think needs to be framed as part of a larger backlash against an athlete who dared upset the setup. I think there's something very ugly at work here where they're trying to get her to know her proverbial place when she has spent the last year saying she's going to be a different kind of athlete. That's why I wanted to bring you on, Dave, because I feel like we touched on this, Jamil, in the conversation we had last week about how she's not just any professional athlete. She's uh, Haitian and Japanese. She's a woman. And so her telling the sport I'm not going to do a thing is a thing that doesn't go over well when you're not a white man. Um, and frankly, so Jamel, speaking to, to Dave's point, do you think that a part of this is actually backlash to the Black Lives Matter protests and the fact that she was using her platform and the attention she gets as the number two player in the world to put a spotlight on Black Lives Mattering? Uh, this is a reaction to just the very resistance of being black and excellent. That's what this all is about. Like Dave said, this is uh, about her support of Black Lives Matter, about her wearing the different face masks at the U.S. Opens with the uh, black victims of police brutality and also those who are wannabe law enforcers, if you will. So this has a lot to do with it. And it's a part of a changing culture that, frankly, establishments like uh, the French Open and Wimbledon and all these long-standing establishment types are not comfortable with. The fact of the matter is a lot of athletes today, especially black athletes, have more leverage, more power, and a strong social media following. They are able to dictate what they want to mm -hmm. do on their own terms. And these leagues and organizations aren't really comfortable with that because they've never had to experience it. And what I love about today's athlete of Naomi Osaka's generation is that they are quick to tell you where you messed up at. And you know I don't want to say messed up. And so she told them and flexed mm -hmm. on them back and said, mm -hmm. I tell you what, I will pull out of this tournament. Because the reality is, at least in the American sports landscape, tennis is not as widely popular, certainly not as the NFL or the NBA or any of the other major sports. They need a multicultural star like her to be at these events. So they even come at her as if they don't need her was just stupid. See, that's why I have a Jamel Hill t-shirt in my closet. It is stupid. <laughs> I know, it, it is stupid. Sometimes you just gotta say that. Dave, we only have one more minute. But one of the things I have been wondering, why don't they ask better questions at these press conferences? I bet she'd be more willing to participate if they didn't ask t terrible questions. They asked bad questions. Well, it, it's a tremendous scrum. It's an ordeal for the athletes themselves. Um, and Naomi Osaka is being open about how it actually makes her feel as she's also dealing with these intersecting issues um, of depression and mental wellness and social anxiety. And I, I'm still, I shouldn't be shocked, but I'm still gobsmacked that in this era where they're being so open about saying, oh, athletes, we want you to share your mental health concerns. It's so important. The leagues are gonna put out PSAs. Oh, look, we just hired a mental wellness coordinator for our team. Well, <laughs> when, when, the, when the road hit the car, they decided what side they were on. It came down to affecting both their pop pocketbooks and then when it came time for them to discipline an athlete that they wanted to discipline, they did not hesitate to say mental wellness. What's that? Hmm. Well, they know now uh, because she's at home and not at the French Open. And so the money they lost, I wonder if they're considering that. Jamel Hill, Dave Zirin, thank you so much for being here tonight for this conversation that we're going to continue having because maybe more will happen. That is it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. The Mehdi Hassan Show is coming up after a short break right here on Peacock.
Tonight, Q and A. Question, what is former National Security Advisor and General Michael Flynn talking about? A coup? Answer, we're not quite sure, but we should all be concerned. Despite efforts to de-platform conspiracy theories, they're alive and well with some prominent Republicans. I'll speak to House Armed Services Committee Chairman Adam Smith. Plus, Democrats walk out in Texas, setting up another round in a battle over voting rights. But if Democrats in Washington are so serious about saving our democracy, why aren't their actions matching their words? I talked to Julian Castro. And 50 years on from the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg is at it again with another fascinating revelation about America and China and nuclear first strikes. The living legend himself joins me live. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. What did you do this Memorial Day weekend? Did you take in a parade honoring fallen service members? Did you reunite with friends and family? Perhaps you barbecued in the backyard or popped open a cold one on the beach? Or maybe you attended the Lollapalooza of Trump election truthers in Dallas. It should be that he can simply be reinstated, that a new inauguration date is set. Yes, that fanfic writer on stage in the leather motorcycle cut was disgraced one-time Trump election lawyer Sidney Powell. She was spinning fantasies for devoted Trump supporters who spent $500 each to attend the For God and Country Patriot Roundup in the Dallas Omni Hotel last weekend. Although most people are just calling it the QAnon conference since it was hosted by major QAnon supporters and full of QAnon shirts, buttons, banners and fever dreams. And Biden is told to move out of the White House. And, <laughs> and, and, and President Trump should be moved back in. But these are simply unserious people saying bizarre things. Why take them seriously? It's not as if there are any sitting members of Congress at that event spouting this stuff. Except there was a congressman there. This congressman, Louis Gohmert of Texas, he used his speech Saturday to downplay the Capitol insurrection. It wasn't just right-wing extremists in there, he said, adding that January 6th couldn't be the worst attack on democracy since the Civil War. Quote, some of us think Pearl Harbor was the worst attack on our democracy. Some of us think 9-11 was the worst attack. Gohmert is also one of the ranking Republican members, I kid you not, on the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism and Homeland Security, attending a QAnon conference. While at the event, Congressman Goman also posed for a photo with a QAnon podcaster who's admitted to participating in the Capitol insurrection. Goman now says he had no idea that this Q-palooza had any connection to QAnon, but his appearance on Saturday came months after Congressman Paul Gosar, also of the GOP, allegedly one of the organizers of the January 6th Stop the Steel rally, attended a white nationalist conference and nearly went on a QAnon podcast before backing out. And where is their boss, House GOP leader Kevin McCarthy, and all this? Remember what he said when asked about Marjorie Taylor Greene's ties to QAnon? I think it would be helpful if you could hear exactly what she told all of us. Denouncing QAnon, I don't know if I say it right, I don't even know what it is. Right. Perhaps it's time he found out what QAnon is, since it's all the rage in his caucus. Can you imagine the uproar if AOC or Ilhan Omar spoke at an antifa convention that advocated the overthrow of the sitting president no you can't because they wouldn't and nothing like this even exists on the american left but maybe we should relax these are just sad people acting out sad fantasies right it's not as if they have a former national security advisor and retired top general advocating for a myanmar style military coup in the united states i want to know why what happened in Myanmar can't happen here. No! <laughs> you know, yeah. no reason. I mean, it, it should happen here. No reason. That's right. 
It's Myanmar, not Minimar, and that's former Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, who was arrested for lying to the FBI, who pled guilty and then got pardoned by Donald Trump. In a statement, Flynn now denies saying what he said, quote, let me be very clear, there is no reason whatsoever for any coup in America, and I do not and have not at any time called for any action of that sort. Hmm. It's weird, not just because of what you just saw on tape, but because Flynn also told Newsmax after the 2020 election that Trump could always try an armed takeover. He could order the, the um, in, within the swing states, if he wanted to, he could take military capabilities and he could place them in those states and basically rerun an election in each of those states. I mean, it's not unprecedented. I mean, these people out there talking about martial law, it's like it's something that we've never done. Martial law, it's cool. Remember all that? Donald Trump liked the idea so much, according to the New York Times, that he floated it to advisors, along with the idea of hiring Flynn as chief of staff or as FBI director. What does the ex-president say now? You'll never guess. On Tuesday, the New York Times reporter Maggie Haberman tweeted Flynn's coup comments and added this, quote, Trump has been telling a number of people he's in contact with that he expects he will get reinstated by August. No, that isn't how it works, but simply sharing the information. Oh, I see. August. Let me ask again, what did you do this past weekend? You probably celebrated the beginning of summer and the return to normalcy. What are Donald Trump and his supporters doing? Apparently fantasizing about an undemocratic, unconstitutional, and maybe violent return to power. Joining me now is Congressman Adam Smith of Washington State, uh, the Democratic Chair of the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, Congressman, thanks for coming on the show tonight. What is your reaction uh, to Louis Goma, a fellow member of Congress, speaking at a QAnon conference where people are talking about military coups, and he's there engaging in January 6th trutherism. Marjorie Taylor Greene was stripped by your party of her committee assignments. What should happen to Louis Goma, and what's your message to Kevin McCarthy? Well, the whole thing is vastly more alarming than people are giving it credit for. I keep hearing people talking about it, and you mentioned it earlier, these conspiracy theories. It's far worse than a conspiracy theory. This is an organized effort to end our republic as we know it because the election didn't come out the way they wanted it to. This is a large group of people. These were the people who were participating in the insurrection and capital riots on January 6th. They care about their ideology more than they care about democracy and they're trying to figure out how to get it done. It, the only thing stopping them is the ability to do it, not the will. And to the extent that people like Louis Gomart and yes. Marjorie Taylor Greene are supporting that, we have to call them out and hold them accountable. Not as, you know, <laughs> expressing some conspiracy theory, but as challenging the very foundation of our republic. We must make that clear. We must hold Kevin McCarthy accountable too for his, you know, passive acceptance of that. So let's talk accountability, Congressman. You're the chair of a congressional committee, not necessarily one that would investigate the events of January the 6th, but shouldn't Democratic committee chairs now lead the way in investigating the Capitol insurrection, getting accountability, given Republicans have blocked the bipartisan commission proposal, given they continue to lie about the insurrection, committee chairs like you have subpoena powers, so why not investigate, call witnesses, do what the Republicans did with Benghazi? Yeah. Well, first of all, I will never do what the Republicans did with Benghazi because that was an absolute embarrassment to the United States Constitution and to our country. Um, and I certainly don't want to flatter them by imitating them. Um, that was just a horrendous misuse of government funds and misuse of the public. And, and part of this whole effort to undermine Democratic elected officials, in that case, Hillary Clinton, all in the effort to make sure that their ideology takes over. But what I have spoken with um, Speaker Pelosi about and what she is going to try and do is set up a select committee to investigate this. I mean, there's a number of different committees and actually my committee would have a small piece of it on armed services. There are a number of different committees who have a piece of this. I think it's wise to have a select committee so it can all be in one so that we don't have you know 10 different committees going in a bunch of different directions. So I support the select committee to do what you just suggested. So. You're the chair, that's good to hear. You're the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. You look at someone like Michael Flynn, former National Security Advisor, retired general, suggesting what seems to be a military coup in the United States. Again, accountability. What should happen with General Flynn? Even as a retired flag officer, doesn't he bear some responsibility for now on multiple occasions suggesting unconstitutional actions by service members? 
Yeah, and let's also remember that uh, Mike, Michael Flynn was the one who showed up at the White House with um, Sidney Powell. I think the My Pillow guy was there as well, yeah. basically to make that argument to try to convince President Trump that he should institute martial law, seize the voting machines, and basically reverse the election. Look, I have not looked into the ins and outs of the specific legal implications here. I mean, what what constitutes you know treason? What constitutes a crime against your country? What do you have to say and do to meet those requirements? But absolutely, what Michael Flynn has done to this point, and certainly you know in that you know video that you just showed, you know g- gets us to the point where you ought to look into it. And then the question is, well, look, and let's not all not forget that Michael Flynn's supposed to be in jail. Uh, but for Donald Trump pardoning him. So he, he has more than committed enough crimes to warrant that type of investigation. The other thing that I'm getting a lot of people talking to me about is, you know, how should this, can Michael Flynn walk around and say that he's a retired, retired three-star general? Is there something we can do about that? Because it is harming the credibility of the Pentagon. And also, and, and Secretary Austin has really been focused on this. There's been a focus on extremism in the military. And part of it is a focus on white supremacy. And obviously, that is a huge concern. But a, a concern that is also not, I don't think, talked about as much is that you get members of the military who agree with Michael Flynn, who agree with these people who say that we ought to have yeah. a Myanmar style coup. And, and that is unbelievably alarming. Let me just say one final thing. The Pentagon, the leadership, even under yep. Trump, Secretary Esper, when he was there, certainly Chairman Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they never stood for any of this. They, they were upholding the Constitution. We can all be very thankful of that. But we need to hold Michael Flynn accountable, and we need to be worried about how broadly this message is spreading within the military. I'm glad you raised that issue because, it's, as you say, there's Flynn saying this stuff. There's members of the military agreeing with him. There's the white supremacy issue that General Austin's looking into. You have two Republican members of Congress, Dan Crenshaw and Tom Cotton, encouraging service members to go outside of their chain of command and complain about, quote, unquote, wokeness uh, in the military. The Army Reserve is investigating an officer now who says he's running for Congress in Arizona. He's giving interviews to Newsmax in his uniform, saying sleepy Joe Biden isn't the real president. I mean... How worried are you as someone uh, who is looking into this as chair of the Armed Services Committee? What can be done by politicians to hold our military accountable? I I am very worried about it. And look, I've been doing this for a long time and I've heard a lot of rhetoric. I've heard a lot of people on both sides of uh, of the issue. I've I've heard Democrats and Republicans both really, you know, go, go to the mat to try to win an election. All right. This is different. This is talking about ending our democracy and ending our republic as we know it. And if you are not willing to accept the constitutional result of a legitimate election, if you say Joe Biden isn't the president, then you are an insurrectionist by definition. If you're hoping to reinstall somebody else, you are into a situation that happens, by the way, in a lot of countries. I, so, I can you know, pin me across the globe here and talk about countries that one side says this guy's president, the other side says that guy's president. Um, Sorry. Um, And, you know, and that's a huge problem. So we really need to to focus on the depths of this issue and get out. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, so on that issue, one last quick question before we run out of time. You mentioned kind of people ending democracy and this happening in other countries. You have Trump now allegedly saying he expects to be reinstated as president by August. And we can laugh at his delusions. But the reality is that the GOP is enabling these kind of delusions. And I want to ask you this question. If the GOP takes back the House and Senate next year, as is likely given the midterms, do you do you worry? that they could refuse to certify a democratic victory in 2024. Absolutely. Don't laugh at these delusions. And it's easy to do. I mean, and and I've been saying this for years. I mean, look, the the late night comedians and everyone else, Donald Trump's sitting right there to make fun of. And past a certain point, it's funny. Despite the the, the way my face may look, I actually have a wonderful sense of humor. And, And I appreciate the jokes as much as anybody. Uh, But this is not a laughing matter. This is incredibly serious what they are trying to do. And yes, I worry that if Republicans get get back into power, they could do this. And we need to separate this from. Look, if you want to get into a debate about whether or not, you know, members of the what members of the military should say about how we handle systemic racism, all these other issues you want to. That's fine. Yeah. But once they start talking about Donald Trump's the president, Joe Biden isn't then they are committing a crime and they are fundamentally challenging our republic in a way that we must take very seriously. We are on this show. Congressman Adam Smith, thank you so much for your time tonight. Appreciate it. 
Thanks. Appreciate your coverage of this. We've talked so far about... Thank you. We've talked so far about what Trump supporters are doing, but we also have to talk about what they believe against all evidence. Joining me now to discuss that is Tina Nguyen. She's a Politico reporter who covers the MAGA movement and disinformation. Uh, Tina, thanks so much for coming back on the show. You are, uh, for good or bad, immersed in this stuff, in this world. You follow it. Uh, you and I both know what doomsday cults are. They love to put deadlines, hard deadlines on their fantasies, and then they move them when the, when the deadline comes and goes. With QAnon, there was election day. That will show everything. Electoral college vote on December 14th. That's when Trump would win. January 6th, what? it'll be wild, Trump tweeted. Then it was the inauguration. Now it's August. Suddenly everything's going to happen in August. When do people, when do enough people realize this is just a grift? Honestly, considering how many times the goalpost has been moved, with movements like these, there will always be a date that they hit and nothing happens. But then there will be something written in the cards or tweeted out by a influencer, or maybe put on Donald Trump's blog, saying, oh no, it's going to be some other day in the future, using some sort of congressional mumbo jumbo to justify it. And as long as people keep believing that there is some way for Trump to come back into power, it's going to happen. It just is a matter of when, at least for them. Yeah. And, I, and of course, you have people like Michael Flynn pumping this stuff out. This is a man with three master's degrees, I believe, who ran the military's intelligence operations, was head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, was national security advisor, and now he's taking backyard oaths to Q. And in December, he was telling Trump to use the military to seize voting machines. I mean, on the one hand, can he really be that stupid to believe this stuff? On the other hand, how seductive is QAnon on the right right now? With someone like Michael Flynn backing QAnon, that lends it a huge air of credence. Because look, you have Michael Flynn with all of the credentials that you've just mentioned backing this conspiracy theory. Now, whether he actually believes in QAnon or not, is, you know, only he and his lawyer, Sidney Powell, could say. But the fact of the matter is his presence gives this enormous boost to QAnon. It gives this sense of credibility, of inevitability, and it's coming from essentially what used to be the top of the Trump administration, save for Trump himself. <laughs> the best part is that QAnon is... Uh, a conspiracy movement that is obsessed with the evils of the deep state and their hero right now is the former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Makes you laugh. Uh, just last week, Tina, we saw new polling that showed 15% of Americans, a quarter of Republicans, agree with the following statements. First, the government, media, and financial worlds in the US are controlled by a group of Satan-worshipping pedophiles who run a global child sex trafficking operation. Second, there is a storm coming soon that will sweep away the elites in power, restore the rightful leaders. And third... Most worrying, true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save our country. I mean, aside from how, how much trouble are we in, but what is driving that? What, what drives those numbers? It is a combination of what is being cycled through right-wing media, what is being promoted through Trump allies, through events like the QAnon rally, the... Um, QAnon influencing, continuing to go through these channels. Uh, but from the very beginning of the Trump administration, there had been this meme going around that there was some official in the Trump White House named Q who had secret arcane knowledge. Now, it's been pretty clear that that was never the case, but as the, as the uh, guy who created the QAnon forum, Ron Watkins, he said right after the uh, president, after Biden was sworn in and Trump was not sworn in, QAnon was sort of a great big family that they all came, that they banded together around. And the principles that fueled the QAnon movement were still there. And at that point, it'd been four years. People kind of glommed onto it and haven't let it go. Yeah. It is deeply worrying, deeply bizarre, and uh, we haven't heard the end of it, that's for sure. Uh, Tina Nguyen, we appreciate your time and your reporting. Thanks so much for coming on the show tonight.
100 years have passed since an armed white mob attacked and destroyed one of the wealthiest black communities in the country, leaving hundreds of African Americans dead, hundreds injured. The mob looted and burned down businesses and homes inside the bustling business district of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, also known back then as Black Wall Street. Most Americans grew up never hearing about the booming business on Black Wall Street or the bloody event that led to its destruction. As for the media, coverage was sparse, and it was only until recent years the Tulsa race massacre even began gaining attention. Last month, 107-year-old Viola Fletcher, one of the survivors, testified before Congress in its hearings on the 1921 massacre. I will never forget the violence of the white mob when we left our home. I still see black men seen being shot, black bodies lying in the street. I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. Greenwood represented all the best of what was possible for black people in America. Absolutely tragic. Today, President Biden met with the centenarians, centenarians, can't even say the word, who lived through the massacre. And he announced several steps aimed at righting the wrongs and injustices of history and resurrecting a dream of rebuilding wealth that was burned to ashes for generations. Imagine all those hotels and dinners and mom and pop shops that could have been passed down this past hundred years. Imagine what could have been done for black families in Greenwood. Financial security and generational wealth. If you come from back lines like my, my, my family, working class, middle class families, the only way we ever able to generate any wealth was an equity in our homes. Imagine what they contributed then and what they could have contributed all these years. Look, when we talk today about reparations, when we talk about affirmative action, this is what we mean or should mean. It's not just remembering history with solemn ceremonies, big crowds, powerful speakers. It's about recognizing that the inequalities and racism and violence of the past still impacts the present in the lives of black Americans in 2021. And it's about restoring all that was taken away from them by perpetrators who walked away unscathed. Coming up, over 100 scholars are sounding the alarm. They say the wave of recent GOP-led bills are posing a risk to democracy and that federal help is needed. Democrats in the Texas state legislature are fighting back on the ground. More on what they're doing with Texas Democrat Julian Castro in 60 seconds. So how was your holiday weekend? As you may have been barbecuing and as insane pro-Trump Republicans in Dallas seem to be advocating a military coup to try and get Donald Trump back as president, supposedly less insane Republicans in nearby Austin, Texas, were thwarted in their attempt to steal back the White House the old-fashioned way. 
through voter suppression. Texas Democrats are vowing to keep up the pressure after successfully blocking, at least for now, GOP legislation to impose sweeping new voting restrictions. If enacted, the Texas bill would end drive through and 24 hour voting, including no Sunday voting before 1 p.m. Critics say that would unfairly burden black voters. The bill would add ID requirements for absentee voting. It would also make it harder for voters with disabilities to get to the polls. And it would make it easier for a judge to overturn election results. No proof that fraud affected the outcome would be needed. I mean, who comes up with this stuff? Seriously, are Republicans offering prizes for the most outlandish and villainous election ideas? One Texas political reporter who's been covering the debate pointed out that Texas Republicans were trying to vote in the middle of the night to ban voting in the middle of the night. Texas Republicans say the bill ensures integrity at the ballot box. But Democrats weren't willing to find out. They staged a last-minute walkout from the State House chamber Sunday night. Just ahead of the midnight deadline, the chair of the House Democratic Caucus sent out a mass text that told other Democrats to leave the chamber discreetly. Do not go to the gallery. Leave the building. A little later, Democrats could be seen gathering at a historically black Baptist church down the road, and Republicans no longer had a quorum in the legislature to hold a vote before the clock struck 12. Finally... For once, when it mattered, Democrats, at least in Texas, were organized and focused and strong, and they got something done. Direct action to protect voting rights in Texas. At a speech today in Tulsa, President Biden announced that Vice President Kamala Harris would be leading the administration's efforts on voting rights nationwide. And now, all Democrats should take note and learn a lesson from what Democrats in Texas accomplished. Because... On the national holiday to honor the men and women that died in service of our country, there were elected officials wrapped in the flag claiming to be patriots while actively working to undermine American democracy. Remember, if Democrats fail on voting rights, it's possible that nothing else they do will matter. So I spoke earlier with Texas Democrat Julian Castro, who was Secretary of Housing and Urban Development during the Obama administration. Before that, he was the mayor of San Antonio. Julian Castro, thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. We are seeing so many instances of voter suppression across the country, Georgia, Florida, all over the place. Put the Texas bill in context. How bad is it compared to the others? Oh, it's a bad bill. Uh, to start with, Texas is already one of the hardest states to get registered to vote and to actually get out and vote. Uh, because of that, we perennially rank near the bottom in terms of voter registration and voter turnout, something like 43rd in terms of uh, turnout and 47th in terms of registration. On top of that, it's like the Texas bill took some of the worst elements of the different states that have already tried this and threw those together uh, to limit voting hours, uh, discourage people from giving folks ride to the polls, uh, prohibit sending out preemptively sending out voter registration uh, cards, all sorts of measures to try and preserve the power of Republicans in office, even as they see a state that is changing in front of their eyes, a state where Barack Obama lost it just a few years ago by 16 points, but Joe Biden came within five and a half points of Donald Trump, and Democrats have made very yeah. strong gains in the last few years. So they're running scared and trying to preserve power, yes. doing everything they can at everybody else's you, expense to do so. You praised the Texas uh, Democrats in the state house for blocking this GOP voter suppression bill, at least for now. And you say Democrats in DC should follow in their footsteps. Uh, but in Washington, of course, Republicans are the minority party and therefore your critics on the right would say, you're being hypocritical. You're saying get rid of the filibuster in DC, but minority Democrats should block majority Republicans in Austin. What do you say to your critics on the right? Uh, I would say that uh, Democrats are actually fighting for voters, period. Whether you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, no matter how you're voting, there's a difference here. One side is actually fighting to expand access to the ballot, to allow people who are eligible to vote to exercise their fundamental right. And the other side is fundamentally trying to cut that off. And so I don't see those two things as being equivalent. Uh, the fact is that uh, the filibuster needs to go, and I hope, especially, that Senators Sinema 
uh, and Manchin, whom I both have a lot of respect for. But this is a wake up call, what's happening in these states, with Texas being the latest example. If Manchin and Cinema don't step up with the other Democrats in the Senate uh, to pass uh, the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, then our democratic process in 22, 24, and down the road is not going to look the same. These Republicans are rigging it so that they stay in power, and that's going to catch up to everybody to the detriment of all of us. So, so you're right. The filibuster is a problem. It's anti-democratic. There are these two senators, maybe more than two, but definitely Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, uh, who are clinging to it. You say you have a lot of respect for them. I'll be honest. I struggle to have respect for them these days, especially when they can't make decent arguments publicly. Kirsten Sinema did not turn up to vote for the commission, for the January 6th commission last week. It was beaten back by the filibuster. Not only did she not show up to vote for it, she's not even given a reason uh, for not voting for it. That's shameful, isn't it? To be a Democratic senator in the United States Senate, to not turn up for a crucial vote, not offer an explanation, no accountability at all. Shouldn't she be condemned for that? Uh, yeah, it's inexplicable. And, uh... I, I believe that every single senator, especially right now, needs to be on the job, uh, needs to be working toward protecting voter rights. And look, uh, we're certainly going to need Senator Sinema and Senator Manchin on a lot of votes. And I hope that this is not a precursor uh, of what's going to happen in terms of her attendance on future important votes. Uh, we need her and everybody else to step up. Uh, and if not, then, you know, without regard to any individual person, look, there are going to be consequences, I think, in the primary, whether it's in Arizona or in other states, if Democratic voters see that their representatives are not doing something as fundamental as trying to protect access to the ballot box. you got to show up. you got to fight. I'm proud of those Texas Democrats this weekend because they stood up and they fought and they used every yeah. tool that they could to stave off SB7. So that should inspire folks in D.C. to do the same thing. They did fight. They did walk out. It was a short-term victory, though, some would say. Texas Republican Governor Greg Abbott is threatening to use his veto power to cut off funding to the legislature if Democrats continue to fight against this bill. He says he'll call legislators back to vote during a special session that's yet to be scheduled. Are Republicans going to win in Texas in the end? You know, I wouldn't be so sure about that. Uh, what's so interesting is that he didn't immediately call a special session. Uh, I think he's trying to read the politics on this. Look, he probably will. They will uh, likely try this again. But at least uh, we've lived to fight another day. In the meantime, uh, again, the United States Senate needs to pass the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and deal with these issues so that uh, we're protected no yeah. matter what state you live in, you have good access to the ballot box. So in order to pass those acts, we need leadership. And leadership in the Democratic Party is supposed to come from the White House, from the President of the United States. He is the de facto leader of your party, Joe Biden. Ron Brownstein writes in The Atlantic that some voting rights advocates are worried that the Biden White House isn't taking the threat to democracy seriously enough. He even quotes a White House official saying, they think they'll be able to organize their way out of this, which is kind of ludicrous. You can't organize your voters around a gerrymander. Are you worried that the White House, the Democratic Party in D.C. is too complacent isn't acting with the necessary urgency when it comes to the GOP's ongoing assault on our democracy? I think they need to make this a top priority. Uh, they need to continue to push and push and push and not let a day go by where this isn't part of the messaging and this isn't part of the, the um, effort they make to get voters uh, to wake up uh, and to get support in the Senate to whip up support to pass those two pieces of legislation. So yeah, I would like to see an even greater sense of urgency from the White House to the Senate. Uh, everything that we need to do to protect access to the ballot box. Because here in Texas, we know the lengths that these Republicans will go to to preserve their power. That's not going away. And the only way that we're going to be able to deal with it is in the United States Senate. 
Indeed, and there will be a vote, says Chuck Schumer, uh, towards the end of this month on the For the People Act. Let's see uh, what happens. Julian Castro, thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. When we return... Good night, Dan. Good night, Dan. Hi, guys. You okay, Dan? Yeah, yeah, I thought I uh, forgot something I didn't. That scene is from the critically acclaimed dramatization of the release of the Pentagon Papers. But what we didn't know until recently was that whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg had copied more, much more at the time. And now those documents are caught in controversy all these years later. Daniel Ellsberg joins me live next with what they reveal. nuclear weapons if we never get to use them okay we did once in 1945 we killed tens of thousands of people in japan with two atomic bombs but that was a one-off right an extreme situation no actually did you know there was an active plan to nuke mainland china too as in the highest levels of the u.s government were planning for an imminent attack just about 60 years ago thankfully president eisenhower stepped in and said it probably wasn't a good idea that's the story that's come to light as a still classified 1966 government study published online is getting increasing attention. The unredacted pages show how the US was thinking about responding to China in 1958 when Beijing began shelling islands under the control of the newly founded Republic of China, also known as Taiwan, and which happens to be a US ally. If you comb through, you'll read that US military officials, quote, felt that the use of atomic weapons was inevitable. And, quote, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs suggested that this move would almost certainly involve nuclear retaliation from the Soviet Union. But if national policy is to defend the offshore islands, then the consequences had to be accepted. Imagine that. The consequences of a nuclear war that could have killed millions of people here and abroad would just have to be accepted as collateral damage in a confrontation with communist China. This shocking disclosure was quietly made public in 2017 by none other than Daniel Ellsberg, who is now so worried about a looming conflict that he wants to share the documents and the revelations with a wider audience. The former military analyst served as a special assistant to the Defense Department during the Vietnam War, and 50 years ago next month leaked the Pentagon Papers, a classified government study that, as the AP put it, chronicles deception and misadventure by the US in Vietnam. Ellsberg made copies of that top secret study about the 1958 Taiwan crisis at the same time as he did the Pentagon Papers. And now given that headlines here and abroad are using the W word when it comes to US-China relations, Ellsberg is hoping people and officials in government pay close attention to what escalating tensions with China nearly led to in the past. Given he almost went to prison, Last time he did this, is Ellsberg, at the age of 90, readying himself to go up against the government again? Daniel Ellsberg joins me now. Uh, Daniel, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, you held on to these documents for decades and put them online in 2017. They're now getting more attention. Why did you wait this long, Daniel? And why do you think now is the right time to be discussing the fact that the US almost dropped a nuke on China? You no, know, the truth is that I was prepared to uh, release 
what I had the, uh, on nuclear war planning as soon as the Vietnam War had ended. I wanted to do what I could to end that war before I brought up, before I went to prison again for uh, on different grounds for putting out the nuclear documents. And when I wrote what a draft of what is now the first third of my recent book, uh, the Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. I submitted that to uh, a publisher, my, my same publisher that published an earlier book, Papers on the War, uh, back in 1975, as soon as the war had ended. And her attitude of the editor was, this will sell 1,400 copies. And I said, well, that's one for every member of Congress and a lot of press. Uh, fine. She said, no, you don't understand what I mean. That means we don't publish it. And uh, indeed, I did try to get that word out uh, various times. The public doesn't want to hear, didn't want to hear, and for except for a brief interval in the early 80s, when uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility were making people aware of what a one megaton bomb would do to their cities. Uh, for once, that's the only period in that 50-year period when people had a really real sense of what thermonuclear war actually meant. That went away. And so, when the Cold War ended, they thought the problem is over. But the weapons are still there. The plans, the threats of yes. initiating nuclear war, first use, are still being made on both sides, by so, the way, now, by the Russians as well as the U.S. So, Daniel, and on that so, note... so uh, I thought this is the time to bring it out, in short. Sorry. You're, so on that note, you mentioned the plans are there, the bombs are there. You're often asked about being a whistleblower, but really by training, by experience, you are a military analyst, an expert on nuclear strategy. In your New York Times interview, you said, quote, I do not believe the participants of this plan to attack China with a nuclear bomb were more stupid or thoughtless than those in between or in the current cabinet. When you look at the current US government, the Biden administration, people like Secretaries Blinken and Austin, how worried are you that some people today really might want a war with China, that we may inch near towards nuclear catastrophe again? Those are uh, two different things in a way, because I think there are very few people who actually want a war with China, and certainly not a yes. nuclear war. And yet they're prepared to gamble, to sort of poke at the bear in the cage or something, you know, to show our anti-China attitudes, our Cold War attitudes, and that neither Democrats nor Republicans are soft on China, that they're actually taking a stands here um, that actually could bring about war, and that very likely would be nuclear war over China, over Taiwan, as it was in yeah. 1958. It was when I read some of those headlines you just put on uh, a month ago that I thought, wait a minute, this... Uh, People have to realize what they're talking about when they're talking about war with a nuclear state, China, but, and especially accepting the idea of nuclear war, which is insane. But I wonder what the stakes are for you personally. We all know releasing classified documents is against the law. There's a possibility the DOJ uh, could come after you under the Espionage Act for doing this, which you're kind of hoping for, I believe, so you can challenge the DOJ's practice of using that act to go after whistleblowers. You want to take on this risk. So what is your game plan exactly? What are you hoping will happen? I hope that people, on the one hand, on the, uh, on the trial, there's no question that what I've just done is as indictable as in the eyes of the Justice Department, which I think is on a wrong track here in the view of our First Amendment. But in terms of the prosecutions they've brought in the last 20 years, especially starting with Obama, oddly enough, and into Trump and now into Biden, who is still pursuing uh, the extradition of Julian Assange, the fact is Julian Assange did that as a publisher, like the New York Times, in publishing this. There is no basis for uh, for indicting uh, Julian Assange that doesn't exist for the New York Times, not only with what he put out, but what I just put out. That's I am not inviting an indictment of the New York Times. I think that would be bad for this country, but I am willing to risk so an indictment of myself. 
and you're a brave man for saying so and doing so. Uh, you mentioned the Assange extradition and the Biden administration. You said in a recent interview with The Intercept that I didn't start leaking. I was the first probably to do a mass release, and I wanted much more of that to happen as a result. More has happened, of course. You know, Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, reality winner, the list goes on. But Manning spent seven years in prison. Assange, as a publisher, as you say, is facing extradition. Winner is still in prison. Snowden won't return from Russia unless he's able to argue a public interest defense, he says, to a jury which the current Espionage Act does not allow for and which Joe Biden supports, as you say. Do you believe there is an ongoing war on whistleblowers, including from liberals? Yes. Uh, one has to say that uh, it was President Obama who campaigned on transparency in government and did not deliver on that at all. And in fact, he indicted and prosecuted three times as many cases as all previous presidents put together. Now, that earlier period yes. was a small number because it really violates our First Amendment. It violates the Constitution. But nevertheless, he brought eight or nine or ten, depending how you count some of these, like General Petraeus, uh, as, as a whistleblower even for simply giving higher than top secret information, much higher. Uh, the highest we have, covert identities of covert agents in a document he gave to his... Uh, Biverable biography for him. He got a slap on the wrist for that. Now, what I'm saying is that there's no question that if you're going to indict Petraeus, like, well, he didn't publish, actually. He wanted his biographer to publish, but he didn't do it. But uh, Reality Winner, who I think was a whistleblower here, uh, very definitely in prison now. The others you mentioned, Ed Snowden in permanent exile. Yeah. Uh, the uh, For me, of course, at 90, uh, the prospect of a sentence uh, such as I faced in 1971, which was 115 years in prison, or Assange is faced with right now, 175 years in prison, a life sentence. Uh, that doesn't mean the same for me at 90 as it means for them. Not that I want to go in prison at all, but in, in a way, for 50 years, and prison we, has been my retirement we, plan. And we don't... We don't want to see you in prison as a retirement plan or otherwise. One last question before I let you go. I One like question. That. You know, we're living in a very different... We're living in a very different uh, era from when you released the Pentagon Papers back in 1971. When you look at the US today, uh, so polarized, so divided, uh, people in their own information bubbles, uh, in social media silos, do you think a modern day version of the Pentagon Papers would have had the same impact today or would it simply be dismissed by partisans who don't like the fact it doesn't fit their political narratives or identities? Maybe when you say that uh, about the great difference from now, uh, I have to tell you about a time when you were very young, I take it. But in 1971, this country was polarized about the Pentagon, about the Vietnam War. And I was called a traitor uh, by very, very widely, though not by the Justice Department, because treason is a very narrowly defined in the Constitution. And I didn't uh, I didn't fit that. But uh, as of today, it's a very good. We are still yeah. making the threat of insane actions, the threat of nuclear attack, uh, yes. the first use of nuclear attack to initiate nuclear war. In a variety of circumstances, we've made that commitment to a lot of allies, and we're in yes. the process, it seems, of treating uh, Taiwan, which the Chinese regard as part of China, but we're, we're in the process of moving toward regarding them as having the same promise that we make to NATO of initiating nuclear war in their defense. That's the promise of and an insane attack, a promise of an insane response. And it's something I think there that should needs... be discussion of it now. Yes, there should. There should be discussion. There should be debate. It's insane to be threatening nuclear war over anything. Daniel Ellsberg, we appreciate you coming on the show, releasing these documents, being willing to take on prison, and we thank you for everything you've done throughout your career. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Up next, Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healey has made her mark by taking on Big Pharma and the opioid crisis. And she's fighting for LGBTQ rights as the country's first openly gay attorney general. I'll talk to her about that and more when she joins me in 90 seconds. Do not go away.
While the country was dealing with the COVID pandemic over the last year, another deadly epidemic hasn't gone away. The opioid crisis. Opioid deaths rose in states across the nation in 2020. Nationally, the CDC found opioid overdoses rose 29% compared to before the pandemic. And as we've covered on this show, at the center of the crisis is the Sackler family. The family owns Purdue Pharma, the company that makes OxyContin and often is blamed for fueling the opioid crisis. In October, Purdue agreed to plead guilty to federal charges as part of an $8 billion settlement. Although the billionaire Sacklers themselves agreed to pay $225 million, million with an M. For many, the settlement, which included neither jail time nor admission of wrongdoing by Purdue or by the Sacklers, was simply too lenient. That includes Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healey, who said the DOJ failed to do its job in the settlement. And she's keeping up the fight. Massachusetts is one of 24 states trying to block the Sacklers bid for immunity from opioid-related lawsuits. And now the Bay State's top prosecutor is also going after the global marketing firm used by Purdue Pharma, Publicis Health, alleging the group used deceptive marketing schemes to sell more OxyContin, fueling the state's opioid crisis. Sadly, Massachusetts reached new highs in opioid deaths in 2020, up 5%. Fatal overdoses rose most in the black, Latino and Asian communities, which were also hit hardest by COVID. Joining me now is Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healey, who was also, I should add, as we kick off Pride Month, the first openly gay state attorney general elected in the United States back in 2014. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. What, in your view, was Publicis Health's role in the opioid crisis, and how should they be held accountable? Well, many thank you so much for having me on, and happy Pride, uh, as we move to talk about not-so-uplifting topics. You're absolutely right. Opioids are continuing to kill people in this country, and we need to do everything we can, and I will as Attorney General, to hold the bad actors accountable. Now, you mentioned we went after Purdue and the Sacklers. We continue that fight. We went after McKinsey, who enabled and helped them in their work. And recently, we went after Publicis. Publicis is a firm that companies hire to help them do their marketing. So what we allege is that Purdue, and this is what the evidence showed, uh, Purdue hired Publicis, paid them $50 million over the course of 10 years for Publicis to increase the sales of Oxy to unprecedented levels. They devised marketing campaigns designed to push doctors to pump and to prescribe more opioids to patients in higher doses and for longer periods of time. This was a public nuisance in the, in the legal terminology um, because these campaigns made this opioid crisis even worse, so, resulting in substantial public harm, and it was also unfair and deceptive. And you have Kathy Sackler of the Sackler family testifying before a House committee in December. Um, and just what she said, astonishing, have a listen, astonishing what she said. Have a listen when she asked whether she'd apologize for her role in the opioid crisis. I have struggled with that question. Yeah. There is nothing that I can find that I, would have done differently. Nothing she'd have done differently, she says. What does accountability for this family look like to you? It means doing exactly what I and other AGs are doing, continuing to hold them accountable in court. Now they've run to bankruptcy court and tried to get the bankruptcy court to give them a pass and to, to waive sort of the claims against them. It's, it's really outrageous. So we're gonna continue to pursue them in court we're going to continue to talk about the Sacklers, to tell the story of what this family did, Nettie. And I thank you for your coverage in, in sharing with the public what actually happened here. This was a company owned and controlled by the Sackler family. And not only did they get it wrong at the beginning by coming up with schemes that ultimately resulted in the deaths of hundreds yeah. of thousands of people across this country, but then they tried to cover it up. They tried to deny it. They tried to buy off regulators yeah. with settlements. It's, it's, a, it's outrageous, and they deserve the public shame and stigma, is, and they deserve to be held accountable in court. It is outrageous, and I do hope you do get to hold them accountable in court. On a different topic, before we run out of time, today marks the start of Pride Month. You were the first openly gay state attorney general and have since been joined by Michigan's Dana Nessel. President Biden said today nearly 14% of his agency appointees identify as LGBTQ. Perhaps most prominently, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, uh, Assistant Health Secretary Dr. Rachel Levine, 
Um, and just last week, White House Principal Deputy Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre became the first openly gay woman to lead a White House briefing. How important is this kind of representation for you? I think it's extremely important. You know, as a lawyer, I got to be a lawyer in the Attorney General's office who brought the country's first successful challenge to DOMA. I know the work that we do as, as lawyers is important, but also I know what it means to have an openly gay Attorney General like myself, like A.G. Nessel. Seeing is believing, and, and that gives hope and inspiration to young people out there in our community, in the LGBTQ community, when they look up and they see members of the federal administration that look like them, that matters. It gives them hope that they can be anything they want to be. And that's what we've got to celebrate and acknowledge this month. We've been through hell with the former president and what he did day after day to attack the civil rights of members of the community for four years. The Biden administration is working hard to undo that. And as a state attorney general, I will work right alongside them to fight for our communities. Before you became AG, you mentioned you spearheaded Massachusetts' challenge to DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. The Supreme Court eventually struck down the law in the 2015 Obev Obegefell's case. I always mispronounce that. This month, the Supreme Court will release its decision in another LGBT rights case regarding adoption by same-sex couples uh, and religious rights. This court has a very different makeup than it did back then. 6-3 conservative majority. Are you worried about how this court might shape LGBTQ rights going forward? You know, absolutely, and we are in that case, we, um, we, we are concerned because the composition has changed. And it's sad to me that we have to go back and fight battles that we previously won. I mean, in this day and age, in this country, Mehdi, there should be no discrimination in housing and employment, you know, anywhere uh, in our schools against people because of who they are. And, you know, right now we've got serious harm to the LGBTQ community. Think about the young people from the community who were working remotely or in school remotely, isolated, uh, really serious mental health issues. Think about the people who didn't find safe shelter in their own homes uh, during, during COVID. So we've got to do everything we can, no matter what the Supreme Court does, to make sure that at the local level and at the state level and through Congress, we are doing what this country is supposed to be about, advancing equality, advancing justice. Absolutely. Advancing equality, advancing justice. Well said. Uh, Massachusetts AG Maura Healy, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the show tonight. We appreciate it. That does it for me tonight, and I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. live right here on Peacock. Good night.